Art is a subjective thing, and it should be a subjective thing. Comedy is dying. False. First, let's establish that comedy is subjective. If art is subjective, and if stand-up comedy is a performance, and if performance is a form of art, then comedy is art and therefore subjective. And since it is subjective, jokes can be funny for some people and unfunny for others. And that's okay! According to the Cambridge Dictionary, subjective is defined as influenced by or based on personal beliefs or feelings rather than based on facts. Well, some people are gonna think this is art, and others are gonna think this is art. It is a fact that this is an art piece. It is an opinion that it is a masterpiece. Moving on. Comedy is not dying. Let's not be overdramatic here. But you're the one who made the intro. Anyway, there's a couple reasons why someone could think comedy is dying. Cancel culture and fragility. Cancel culture has been a problem for the ages. It's not a new thing. Great minds like Oscar Wilde and Alan Turing were canceled just for being homosexual during the late 19th and early 20th century. While it isn't new, it does hurt people. This is the case for Natasha Times, where it took less than 240 characters and 35 minutes to dismantle a career and book she spent four years writing. Destroying someone's career for a misstep should not be the first action. You don't fire an employee when they do something wrong, like give a customer a wrong order. But how does this apply to comedy? I'm glad you asked! Comedy changes over time, and that's no secret. Ramuglia puts it plainly when he says, Comedy is a tough nut to crack because what is funny one year might not be funny next year. People have been cancelled for things they've said in the past that were okay to say back then. James Gunn, director of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, was fired by Disney after jokes he wrote on Twitter several years ago involving pedophilia and rape were resurfaced. To which actor Dave Bautista, who plays Drax in the film, responded saying, Where I'm at right now is if they don't use that script, then I'm going to ask them to release me from my contract, cut me out, or recast me. I'd be doing James a disservice if I didn't. It's the changing of times that made things of the past, well, inappropriate. Another thing people will say is killing comedy is how easily offended people are now. But I think Emerson said it perfectly when they wrote, people are not more easily offended now, but they are more vocal about it. Because so many youths have access to a phone and a platform to easily voice their opinion, so many of them will be hurt. It's not that people are easily offended now, it's that many more are communicative on what offended them. So many people are quote, easily offended. Just look at the checkout aisle of your local grocery and notice how the magazines in the aisle capitalize on it. Like, look at this Cosmopolitan cover, have sexier sex. Well, I'm offended that they're saying that my intercourse life isn't sexy, but I'm also intrigued on what advice they'd have to offer. And that's how they make a sale. This seems to be a marketing thing that they've been doing for a while. Being easily offended isn't new either. Bob Dylan offended a lot of his fans by switching from acoustic to electric, but now that is nothing, which is true to a lot of our first world problems. When Bob Dylan performed for a concert in 1965, he was booed off stage. But what prompted the outright booing was a sense of dismay and betrayal on part of an audience unprepared for a singer's new artistic direction. An audience ruined a show because of one man's new artistic passion. To give one more historical example, during World War II, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, America was so offended by the act that FDR enacted Executive Order 9066, which placed every Japanese person in America into what they dubbed Japanese internment camps. That affected the lives of about 117,000 people, the majority of which were US citizens. If you think we're easily offended now, we've been easily offended. To be fair, it's pretty easy to offend a nation when you bomb their harbor, kill 2,400 people including civilians, and destroy or damage 19 of our naval ships. Yeah. Comedy has been changing over time. Not even 10 years ago, we were laughing at videos in a six second format. Road work ahead? Uh, yeah, I sure hope it does. 
Back then, our humor had been adapted to take in setup and then punchline in a rapid, fast manner. So fast, in fact, that many news sources reported on how our attention spans are shrinking. Comedy can also be seen changing in what's allowed to be joked about. By, most of them are good, but this one guy said, um, wow, misfits don't, uh, don't say slurs anymore. Like, misfits don't even say the N-word anymore. 2021 <laughs> has no ruined chance. them. <laughs> that was like... You, you don't even say the n-word yeah, anymore. I was, I was like, I was like, holy <laughs> what? what a critique. Dark humor used to be just blatant racism or offensive humor. Here's a quick clip of dark humor performed by comedian Jimmy Carr. I bought a rape alarm because I kept on forgetting when to rape people. <laughs> However, stand-up comedy puts you in the right mindset to understand that you're attending a show and the jokes don't really reflect the comedian's true personality. Dark humor is still offensive humor, which is the whole point of it being dubbed dark, but thankfully comedy has evolved so much so that dark humor just really isn't okay. One could argue that subjects becoming unlaughable is creating a depreciation in comedy, but I argue that this allows for more creativity and cleverness needed to make a nice joke. You shouldn't have to be offensive to create humor. Sketch comedy is a great example of humor being created through situations and not needing to be offensive to make a joke. A sketch comedian I enjoy is Gus Johnson, and here's a quick clip from a sketch he did titled, When you go to class and open your laptop but forget you were looking at adult things. Older generations often will say that newer generations are becoming more fragile because what was allowed in their time isn't allowed anymore and is deemed inhumane and not okay. I'm sorry, Gramps, but we just don't think that segregating our bathrooms is very hip anymore. You old bad. Eat your soup. The point is, comedy is evolving, not dying. What is found as funny changes all the time. And that's natural and has been something that's been occurring forever. Cavemen would laugh at ooga booga poop joke we would laugh at Amogus Sus. Maybe we haven't changed. Facebook moms laugh at minion memes, and later they'll find some other character they like to put wacky text next to. If stress burned calories, I'd be a supermodel. Comedy gold. Hey, kid. Do you want this nail? How about this sledgehammer? Because with it, we can drive the final nail into this coffin. Let's go. I'd like to look at a pure example of comedy changing. I assume we're all familiar with Shakespeare, the famous playwright during the 16th century who worked in the Globe Theater. His plays became so famous that even the Queen of Italy would come to watch. But I'm not going to talk about Shakespeare, no, because the only thing comedic about him is how many plays and poems he wrote before his passing. Let's take a deep dive into one of his comedies titled The Taming of the Shrew. In the beginning, we meet a drunkard named Christopher Sly. While stumbling on his way home from the bar, he passes out on a road and a noble returning from hunting spots Sly slumped on the street. The noble decides to take Sly into his abode and dress and pamper him as if he were a noble, attempting to make this beggar think that his commoner days were a dream and that he was a noble all along. Through multiple trials and acts to convince Sly he lost his memory and was always a noble, the prank succeeds. Now let me take a moment to say that this is still pretty funny. It's a nice concept and a funny idea, and overall is still humorous even though it was written ages ago. A good practical joke. After being convinced that he's a noble, a troop of players arrive to the abode and perform the main course of the script, The Taming of the Shrew. From here we go from introduction to acts of the play. To summarize, The Taming of the Shrew takes place in Padua. When a man from a noble family named Lucentio arrives with his manservant slash best friend Tranio to pursue academics, Lucentio catches eye of a lovely lass in the crowd of Padua upon entering, named Bianca, and falls in love at the sight of her. Baptista, Bianca's father, is in the crowd thwarting off suitors for Bianca and is telling them that in order for Bianca to be wed, Catherine, his eldest daughter, must be wed first. This is where we'd meet the two other men chasing after Bianca, an older gentleman named Grimio and a younger man named Hortensio. Grimio and Hortensio tell Baptista that no one would want to marry someone like Catherine, to which one of my favorite lines from this play is delivered. The only possible interest I could take in you would be to comb your noddle with a three-legged stool and paint your face and use you like a fool. I still remember my English teacher having to explain to us what painting meant in that line, because she was going to paint his face with his own blood by, uh, beating him with a stool? From there we get the main conflict of this play. Bianca, who has many suitors, cannot be wed 
until this seemingly vile Catherine is wet first. Hortensio and Grimio agree that they need to find someone to wed Catherine. Hortensio's friend Petruchio arrives in Padua, having a funny play on words interaction with his servant Grumio. After Petruchio says, Hortensio, the situation is that my father Antonio is dead, and I have set off into this crazy world to see if I can marry well and make good life for myself. I have money in my purse and a property at home, so I'm off to see the world. To which Hortensio responds, Petruchio, shall I be frank? I know where you can find a shrewish and unpleasant wife. I doubt you'll thank me in the end, but she's rich. All right, she's rich. Establishing the man who will wed Catherine and make Bianca available. Later on, Petruchio and Catherine meet, to which the audience can see both are ill-mannered and belligerent. Petruchio calls her Kate and is determined to tame her. Petruchio tells Baptista that he'll wed Kate on Sunday quickly after this interaction, and Baptista agrees to this wedding. Catherine's wedding day arrives, but Petruchio is nowhere to be seen. He arrives supremely late to his own wedding and is dressed in the 16th century equivalent of clown clothing making a mockery of his own wedding. Petruchio at the reception forces Catherine to come home with him, denying her food and her gifts. And then when they arrive to his place, he keeps her awake all night. Towards the end, when Petruchio and Catherine arrive for Bianca's wedding banquet, the ladies all go use the restroom. In their absence, Petruchio, Lucentio, and Hortensio all bet on who has the most obedient wife. Seeing Petruchio bet for Catherine as the most obedient wife, Catherine being the most disobedient woman they've seen in their lives, they take on this bet. To determine obedience, they each send a servant to fetch their wives. Lucentia's servant comes back with a message from Bianca saying that she is busy. Orchintia's servant comes back saying that his wife insists that he come to her instead. Petruchio sends his servant to fetch Kate and to everyone's surprise, she's obedient and comes. The comedy being in the fact that this woman who was so ill-mannered in the beginning of the play has changed to be the best wife among them. The, now there's a lot to get from this. Shakespearean comedy still has some funny parts. The play on words altercation between Petruchio and Grumio where Petruchio tells Grumio to knock on the door and Grumio's confusing it for knock on his master and starting a physical fight. And the clever word choice Shakespearean threats that Catherine made are just delicious. I still personally enjoy those. But the overarching story of a woman being abused and harassed into obedience by a belligerent man who only married her for wealth is a story that is not appropriate today and shows a clear changing of comedy through time, as well as a change of culture. Yeah, <laughs> That should be the final nail. If I made you laugh once during this video, then that's proof enough that comedy isn't dying. It's becoming more of a generational inside joke, especially with memes. Comedy isn't dying, it's changing.